Hello there, and welcome back to Casual Fridays, the podcast where we talk about bringing mindfulness into the workplace. You know, we talk, um, I talked a lot last week about kindness, you know, and um, and I, <laughs> you know, it's very rare that I do this, but I'm going to link last week's episode with this week's episode because, you know, kindness is that important. You know, as we, you know, mindfulness itself, you know, when I say bringing mindfulness to the workplace, right, the, the, you know, kindness is not just sort of a a sidecar to that or, you know, or, you know, an afterthought, if you will. Kindness is integral to mindfulness. In fact, there's a lot of people who call it kindfulness or heartfulness as opposed to mindfulness. Now, The reason I say that, because, you know, mindfulness is really just about paying attention in the present moment, right, which, but without judgment, right, and that's the key, right, is that, is that we can, you know, we can very easily pay attention, and, or, I mean, maybe not easily, but it is possible to pay attention, and it's possible to even pay attention without judgment in a way, but still, you know, have some sort of ulterior motive that does not take into account other people, right, or, or even the environment or the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And so mindfulness as we, you know, as, as a sort of practice or tradition, you know, demands that there's a level of kindness that, that is involved with that attention that we pay to the present moment without judgment. And, <clears throat> and really what that means you know, there's a, a, a doctor I'm going to quote here in a couple of minutes, um, Dan Siegel, um, who, who calls kindness, you know, one of the, the ways he describes kindness is a universal positive regard, right? Which is just to say that, you know, I want everyone to be well. I want myself to be well. I want you to be well. I want those people to be well. I want the world, every living being in the world, I want to be well and to be happy and to be, you know, okay. Maybe better than okay. And so what does that mean though exactly, right? Like if we talk about that that sort of, you know, I want you all to be okay, what we're really saying in that statement is that I'm acknowledging that my okayness or lack thereof has nothing to do with your okayness or lack thereof. In other words, if I'm having a rotten day and I'm really struggling with something, it does me no good at all. It does not make me struggle less. It does not make the pressure less. It does not improve my situation at all for you also to be struggling. And that if you are not struggling, if I wish for your well-being, well, then I'm, in a sense, getting out of my own suffering. And this is the key. This is the key. Because kindness allows us to get out of our head a little bit, get out of ourselves, get out of our, our, our own, you know, pressures and, and, and you, know, um, you know, stress and, and, and worry and, and that internal dialogue that's going on. Last week, I talked about how this is how uh, kindness becomes what we might call an equanimity, Right. If I meet every moment, every circumstance, and, and it's not about getting it right, and it's not, it's never about like being a hundred percent of anything. So please, you know, understand that that when I say if I if I always meet the, the moment, I don't always meet the moment that way, and and nor will you in all likelihood. Not all, not every single moment. I, I get most of them. You know, most of my experiences, I am meeting this way. But the point is though that we don't want to rigidly hold to something. Okay, just like, you know, in in meditation, for instance, right? Meditation is not about holding on to the attention and to to lock into something, to never wander. It's the nature of the mind to wander, just like it's the nature of the mind to perceive threats in other people. And so, and so we read into things. And so, so the, the mind is always just, again, getting back to my meditation uh, analogy, when, when we sit in meditation, it's not about how can I hold my attention. It's about watching my attention, you know, drift off and then bringing it back. Every time I do that, I build a strength. It's not much different from going to the gym, you know. If I went to the gym, for all of you on the uh, on the podcast, I'm holding my my arm in like a you know like a, a flex, like you know like the bicep flex, right? <clears throat> and if I was to hold 
a barbell like this for an hour at the gym, you know, uh, nobody, nothing would happen. Nothing would happen to this muscle. I mean, maybe a very, very slight increase in mass in the muscle, but almost nothing, almost imperceptible. So when I, when I work out, I don't just sit here like this. I don't just flex my muscle with a weight in it and expect something to happen. What I do is I let go and I contract and I let go and I contract. And it is that process of going and coming back that builds the muscle mass. So the same thing is true when we're, again, whether it's meditation, when our mind wanders off, we bring it back. When it wanders off, we bring it back. That's like doing a flex and doing a, uh, you know, a, a rep with a, a barbell for our brain, right? <laughs> for the attention in our brain, the ability to pay attention. The same is true with, with people, you know, as I find myself, oh, well, I'm not treating this person with kindness. Well, now's the moment where I come back to kindness. And the more I do that, the stronger my, my instinctive and again, the habitual way in which I meet people. That's why I gave you last week a couple of, uh, of very simple exercises, like when you're sitting down in the conference room or in the Zoom call before the thing gets going and everybody's just sort of, you know, making small talk or, you know, f shuffling through their notebook or, or on their phone or whatever, right? Um, you know, in that moment, take that, take that time, you know, 10 seconds or so and, and just wish everybody well. Just, you know, I want you to be well. That's all that kindness is. But last week's episode was called The Power of Kindness, and it was called The Power of Kindness for a reason, because it is so, so powerful. I mean, it changes everything. I could tell you stories. I don't have time in this podcast, but if you ever want to hear my stories, I'll try to do a couple of episodes. Um, uh, they, they are on the Showing Up to Life podcast episodes. If you want to dig through some of those, uh, you'll hear some of my stories. How, you know, I used to be so, <laughs> so unkind. I used to be someone who was, you know, I would be, I would treat people in a dehumanizing way, in fact. You know, if you, uh, I think I might have mentioned it last week <clears throat> in Casual Fridays that uh, there was one time where I called a 16 year old clerk in a pet store uh, a really, really terrible, terrible label and, and right to his face, this little boy. And I still feel so, so ashamed of myself having done that. I've forgiven myself, I've done the work around it, but still it's like, wow, I can't believe I did that. But that was just one of a million. I mean, I used to do that all the time, all the time. <clears throat> and what happens is, as I, as I mentioned last week, two things are happening when I do that, right? Or actually a number of things. But, but the first thing that's happening, or it's flip your coin, one or the other, I'm creating division between me and everybody else, right? I'm not, I'm not in a, a cohesive, connected um, uh, stance with them or position with them which is the truth, right? We are connected. And when we, when we practice unkindness, we break that connection. And as a result of breaking that connection, we suffer, right? Because we tend to, we, we get to believing that that separation is true. We, we get to believing that we are isolated, that these people around here are adversarial to me. They're not, you know, part of a harmonious, you know, cooperative, uh, you know, experience of, of the universe, you know. But the universe is cooperative. It is cohesive. We are all connected. This is scientifically shown through, through the, the, um, the, the study of mirror neurons, right? That we have mirror neurons in our brains, which replicate what we, you know, so we feel what someone else feels. Not just that we can visualize it, but we actually experience it. There's also the vagus nerve, which, which regulates our heartbeats. So, so if, if you and I were into, in a conversation with each other, right, our heartbeats would sync up with each other. I mean, that's amazing. So would our breath, right? And then there's also just the general empathy that we understand. And there's all these ways that we've seen in science that, that, that we are actually connected. It's not just a, a woo-woo concept, you know? It's, it's scientifically measurable that we are connected to one another. And when we, 
when we practice something other than kindness, because you're practicing one way or the other, as I talk about mindfulness, right? As, we, as we're studying and, and, and practicing mindfulness, you know, we had, had this sense that, that we're practicing something for the first time. I've never practiced before. Woo, this is fun. No, no, no. You've actually been practicing your whole life. Just unwittingly, <laughs> you've been practicing a way of not being present. You've been practicing a way of not being kind. <clears throat> And in the absence of that kindness and, and whatever it is that fills the void left from that, the absence of that kindness, it is cultivating this, this understanding, this, this misunderstanding, perhaps, of, of the world being so separate and so isolating. And so, you know, even, you know, at that point, we feel like the world is combative. We feel like it's a, it's a dangerous place. And it's not to say that there aren't dangers in the world. Of course there are. But, you know, we have a tendency to think the absolute worst. And because, again, this is part of what our brain is doing all the time. If you hear, uh, if you're off on a hiking trail somewhere, you know, and you hear a little rustling in the in the woods next to you, right, you're ancient. I mean, for, for 200,000 years, <laughs> your nervous system has heard that rustle and said, oh crap, that's a bear or something really dangerous. The reason for that is because if, you, if your body believes that it's a bear and it turns out to be a bunny, well, then you prepared for no reason, but nothing was lost, right? You, you, you positioned your body to run the heck away from there if it's a bear but it turns out to be a cute little bunny, so you can relax. Okay, no harm done. But if you assume everything's a bunny, well, one day it's going to be a bear, and then you're just lunch, right? There's nothing you can do about it at that point because you have no defenses, right? So this is an ancient, you know, thing that we're 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 habitually driven to do. So that way, if if we if we give that that system just a little bit of help with the absence of of kindness, it tends to take over. And we tend to think that everything is so scary. Everything is so dangerous. You know, even as I was talking last week about, uh, I think we called her Judy, right? The lady with the fish in the microwave, right? Like, like Judy might be a wonderful human being who just has this really, you know, disturbing tendency of, of smelling up the office every Friday, right? But maybe she's eating fish for religious reasons. Maybe she's eating fish for health reasons. Maybe there's a, there's a restriction on her that this is all Judy can do, right? But we're taking that action of Judy in the unskilled mind. We are saying that everything Judy does about is, is like this, is horrible and bothersome and, and so difficult to deal with. I think last week I even said maybe she, you know, hurts cats on the weekends or something horrible like that, right? I mean, I'm laughing because that's a silly example, right? But the point is that that's the sort of tendency that we get into. Like, this is such a horrible person because this thing that she's doing with the fish. But the reality might be that she's a wonderful human being, somebody you would be, you know, lucky to know, but here I am judging her because of, you know, what she's doing. And I feel disconnected, right? And that's, and so, so when we practice kindness, what we're doing is we're practicing, you know, really what we're practicing is seeing what we call the innate goodness in everyone, right? Because it's there. It's there. Even the most hardened criminals, you know, they came into this world with an innate basic goodness, just like you, just like me. And as we cultivate this, you know, in, in Buddhism, they call it the inner nobility, right? And when we find our own inner nobility and the inner nobility of others, or again, in modern scientific parlance, that innate basic goodness, and this is shown through, through exhaustive experiments with babies, you know, babies who are, you know, nine months old before they, they're old enough to like have been, you know, impacted by the world around them, <clears throat> you know, they show them a couple of puppets. One puppet is, oh, Oh, so nice. Let me give you a little present. Oh, you're so sweet. I'm give you a kiss on the cheek. Ah, oh, you're so kind and lovely. <laughs> and then you have another, you know, uh, puppet that's, oh, I'm going to take your present away. And oh, I'm so bad. I'm going to punch the other puppet. And blah, blah, blah. Right? Like, and they measure the the baby's, you know, respiratory and, and heart rates. And they measure the, the dilation of the pupils. And we're talking about with extraordinarily delicate machines. Like they're measuring very, very, very slight shifts in these things. 
and like 10 times out of 10, you know, aside from any sort of maybe uh, disorders that might be happening, right? But, but any, you know, healthy, you know, sort of normal, you know, anatomically normal baby is always going to gravitate towards the, the kind puppet. Always. Because we all have this resonance of kindness and goodness in us. Now, it is true that some people have become so hardened and so, you know, they've buried this inner goodness that, that it'll never be found, right? So this is not to say that you can go up to a, you know, a serial killer and say, oh, let me find your, in, your inner nobility, <laughs> you know? No, you got to protect yourself. And there are mean people. You know, there are people in your office who are incapable of, of connecting back to that inner nobility. But the advantage that you have is that you can recognize that it is in there. And what that does, it doesn't do anything about Judy or, or the other lady who's so mean or the other guy who's so mean in the office. What it does is it changes the way you experience them. And that is everything. As I mentioned last week, kindness becomes an equanimity in this sense. Right, The way that I can, you know, no matter what the circumstances, no matter where I am, no matter who I'm with, no matter whether it's raining or it's sunny or it's warm or it's cold, no matter any of these details, I can always meet the moment and anyone involved in the moment with kindness. Always. Now, again, it's not about being rigid, <laughs> and 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 if you if you you know if you lose your sense of kindness or you lose the intent of kindness, it's it's just a matter of returning to it. It's not a matter of blaming. It's not a matter of saying, "Oh, I'm such a horrible person. I can't do it." You know, Art would be so ashamed of me. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's nothing like that. It's just because again, it's it's important to remember that we're we're we're, we're working against existing habits. Now, some of you might be more habitually and naturally kind. You might not be the type of person who calls a 16-year-old boy this horrible, horrible word that I called the 16-year-old boy about I don't know, eight years ago or something like that. <clears throat> and so, so, again, it's all on a spectrum. It's all on this analogic, you know, wavelength, right? That, that, that you know, it, it, where you are is all that matters, in this context. And so, you know, as Arthur Ashe said, we start where we are, we do what we can, we use what we've got, right? So, so nobody expects you to be anything other than what you are right now. But as we develop the, the awareness, the self-awareness through the practices that I talk about here, right, we, we start to see, okay, where am I kind? Where am I not kind? Where could I be more empathic? Where could I be more compassionate? Because that's really what kindness opens us up to, right? Kindness as we, as we you know, cultivate this equanimity of kindness, which is, again, just practicing, right? It's just a matter of doing something over and over, just like the practices I gave you last week. If you just do those all the time in every meeting you sit down in and you just look at the people around and just say, I wish you well in your mind, right? That is going to develop a habit. And that habit is that every person that you meet, you're going to start with that kindness. Like, that's the starting point. Where are we going to go from here? Oh, you're being a dysregulated, you know, you know, you are in a state of dysregulation and you're dangerous to me. So I'm putting up a boundary and stepping back. Doesn't mean I'm becoming less kind. But you, this other person, well, you're really, you know, I feel warmth. I feel an in invitation from you. I'm going to see if we can go get a cup of coffee together because you might be my new friend. And then there's everything in between, right? So, so kindness is not about the outcome, right? It's not about making lots of friends, you know, but again, it's about, it's about how I show up in each moment. It's how I, my body, my emotions, my thoughts, how do these process you as we interact with each other? That's what kindness is really about. Now, <clears throat> you know, the, the, um, <laughs> one of the most amazing 
parts. And and this is also, I mean, in, in my own personal experience, as I've, you know, believe me, I am the opposite of the guy who eight years ago said that thing to that kid. I mean, I, I, there's no circumstance that could allow me to say that at this point, like zero, there's zero percent chance. I promise you that. Like, I would give you a million dollars if you could find me doing that. Even though I don't have a million dollars, I can still promise that because it just isn't going to happen. I'm a changed person. There's no, that, that person, in a sense, does not exist. Now, why is that? It's not because I went to some, you know, uh, you know, went through some, you know, medical procedure or, or had some like electroshock therapy or something like that to, 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 to snap me out of something right? What it is, actually, is integration. Dan Siegel, as I mentioned a few moments ago, right, he's a doctor who's uh, the head, he was the head of the uh, Department of uh, Psychology, I think, in in UCLA. Um, He's been a a pediatrician, he's been a psychiatrist, he's been a a, a medical doctor. He's done, he's truly like an amazing, amazing guy, you know, and also best-selling author of, I don't know, probably 10 books or something like that. Um, A teacher, uh, uh, just an all-around wonderful human being. I highly recommend you look him up. You're you're really going to love him. Anybody who doesn't already know who he is. Um, He's very, very famous. Um, And so so I took a course with him actually two years ago, just this month, two years ago. I can't believe it's been two years. I thought it was last year. (laughs) That's how fresh it all is still in my mind. And one thing that Dan told us in, in one of the calls, there was a six-month uh, course, and so each month we had a call with Dan. Otherwise, it was just a pre-recorded course. But then, you know, each month we had a, a live call where we could get on a video call and with him and ask him a question. And so he has this this wonderful quote that he's written on the side of his Mindsight Institute in the in Southern California, where he he's located. Um, and the quote says. Integration made visible is kindness and compassion. Integration made visible is kindness and compassion. Now, the integration that he's referring to is the integration of the brain and nervous system, right? Our brains and nervous systems are this vast, complex, you know, many faceted (laughs) organs, right, that that have, have, you know, like all kinds of different areas that are doing very specific things. Integration means that those those different areas are performing at their their peak, like they're differentiated in, in the sense that they're doing what they do very, very well, which doesn't happen in inattention, right? Attention, you know, creates this this, you know, this integration, and then they link. Right, so so the, they they become differentiated, but then they link. Now that's a little technical. We don't really have to. You don't need to understand that. Just understand that that integration means that your brain is working in harmony and optimization. Right, and this is this is the good stuff. <laughs> okay. Now, in this call that I had with Dan, right, he's you know he kept saying this quote: "Integration made visible, you know, is kindness and compassion." And so I said, if that if that is true, if if integration is the result, you know, or if if attention training, you know, produces the integration, and then that produces kindness and compassion, I said, well, then is it not true also that that practicing kindness and compassion will also promote integration? There's like 800 people on this call, many of them PhDs and PhD candidates and, you know, working psychiatrists and stuff like that. And here's little old me with my long hair. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and he said that that was the most important question anybody had asked to that point. Because, yes, that is the thing. That if we practice the kindness and compassion, just like we practice the attention, it promotes the same process of integration, which which is the fruits of integration are almost boundless and, and, and impossible for me to describe. And this is why I think I am incapable of being mean to people now. I'm incapable of it. Like, even if I tried, I don't think I could do it because of the integration in my brain. Now, which came first, chicken or the egg, right? Did it come because I was practicing kindness or did it come from the attention? I don't care. <laughs> it does not matter at one lick. What matters is that it, it's the truth. And then I can go into even an adversarial experience 
and I can maintain my level of integration, my level of self-regulation, my level of emotional intelligence in the face of whatever anybody wants to do. Give me Judy, give me the, the other pro, whoever in the office, I can handle it because of the practice that I've done. Now, compassion, right? As we, as we, you know, see the world in this equanimity of kindness, right? Then what happens is we notice suffering more readily and more easily. It's more apparent to us, the suffering that people are going through. And so when we see somebody like Judy, who keeps doing this stuff that everybody hates, everybody keeps saying, Judy, the fish is killing us. Why are you doing this? And she keeps doing it. We recognize that Judy's probably in a place of suffering on some level. There's something that, that, you know, if she was in a place of integration and she was in a place of happiness, she probably wouldn't do what she's doing. Or she would make some kind of accommodation. Again, the fish thing, who knows, right? Maybe again, maybe it's a diet thing, who knows? But 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 whatever behavior we see someone doing, right? When you see, you know, one of the viral TikTok videos of some, you know, lady or or guy in a in a Starbucks, you know, getting so mad at the young barista that they throw the cup at them. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about, right? When that person did does that. If we are in a place of integration and we are in a place of, of, of regulation and emotional intelligence that comes from that integration, well, then we can see that that person is doing that because they are suffering. They're doing that because they're, they're experiencing stress or they're experiencing some sort of emotional overwhelm. Now, again, their inner nobility might be so buried that nobody's ever going to find it again. And it doesn't mean that we have to say, oh, well, you know, too bad you got all that coffee on you, little lady, you know, um, you know, it's just he was suffering. It doesn't matter. No, 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 that's not the case at all. I mean, there's still consequences. There's still, you know, boundaries that we put up where there's still self, um, you know, self-advocacy that we need to always be aware of and always be practicing as well. But what it does is it changes the way now I meet the next moment, right? Like after I see this going on, I might get so mad at that person that did that, that now I get in the car and I get on the phone and I'm yelling at somebody, right? You see how that works? And so the power that we're talking about is the power of your choice to, to, to live the way that you want to live. And that is the most beautiful thing we can do. And practicing kindness is a pathway to all of that. That's how powerful it is. All right. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I know we went a little longer. I know this, I guess maybe this, these are going to be 30-minute episodes. I'm trying. I really am. Um, pardon me. I just brushed my teeth, so my, uh, my mouth is a little dry. But um, So I have another practice for you a practice that is going to really cultivate this kindness for you. Now, the practices I gave you last week, if you just do those, you'll be fine. But I have another one, a really beautiful, special practice, and it's called Three Plus Me, okay? And I would love to send it to you. But here's the thing. It would take too long to describe it, and I need to know that you want it, and I need to know where to send it. Okay, so there's no cost involved, none at all. But all I need you to do is send me an email at the address art at artburnscoaching.com. That's A-R-T at A-R-T-B-U-R-N-S-C-O-A-C-H-I-N-G dot C-O-M. And all you, 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 I mean, certainly I would love to get a message from you, but even if you just put in the subject, send me three plus me or send the practice. Okay, just send the practice. Let's do that one. For everyone who writes that email, send the practice. I will shoot you back an email with the practice in a, uh, a PDF form that you can print out, put on the wall of your office so that everybody can use it if you want. You don't have to. Um, but it's a beautiful practice that you can do just for a couple minutes every day. And I promise this is the, the, the I mean, this is the beauty, this practice. I love it. All right. And so, by the way, before we go, though, I just want to say that 
you know, as we practice this kindness, you know, three plus me indicates that we're also giving some kindness to ourselves. And that also opens us up to what we call self-compassion, which is the ability to see when we're having a hard time. And um, we're going to get into that a little bit next week. I'm looking at my notes, but, but essentially, you know, what we want to recognize is that, is that when we're suffering ourselves, it's just like seeing somebody else suffering, right? If we see somebody else crying, we don't stand there with our hands on our hips and say, oh, come on, get your stuff together. You know, what are you doing? You're being so stupid, right? But sometimes that's how we talk to ourselves. And so again, it's not, it's not a separation, right? It's not internal and external. It's internal and external all at once. All right, everybody. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. I really wish you well. And, uh, and I will see you again soon. Or I'll be, <laughs> I won't see you, but I'll be again, I'll be back again soon next Friday. Uh, but please, if you, um, if you're enjoying these episodes, um, remember that there's also the showing up to life episodes. Um, and they're on the same channel, so I'm sure you've seen them. But anyway, uh, I wish you well, and I'll be back again soon. Take care, everybody. And, and send me that email if you want the practice, or just send me the email just to say hi. I'll see you later. Bye-bye.